Good afternoon, everyone. Bonasera or Bonas Tardes. Uh, so today, believe it or not, is our 23rd day of our liver imaging series. That's our 23rd actually lecture, not day, because by days it will be like 30 second or so. Uh, it is my honor and the pleasure to introduce uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Meg Lubner. Dr. Lubner is an associate professor of radiology in the abdominal imaging and intervention section at the University of Wisconsin. She completed her undergraduate and medical degrees at the University of, uh, of Wisconsin. So she has been always there. She uh, did the internship and diagnostic radiology residency at the WashU, Washington University in St. Louis. When was that, Meg? I was there in 2001. That was 03 to 08. Okay. So so you uh, did... I just missed you. Yes. So you did the radiology residency at WashU in St. Louis, Missouri. And then uh, mm -hmm. she has returned to the University of Wisconsin, where she has completed a fellowship in abdominal imaging and intervention, and subsequently joined the staff in University of Wisconsin. She's currently serving as the medical director of clinical CT and co-director of the CT research program. She's an active member of multiple committees with RSNE, ARRS, and Society of Abdominal Radiology and she has published over 140 manuscripts. Her clinical and research interests include oncologic imaging, advanced CT application, CT biomarkers and image-guided interventions and ablation. One thing I want to say about uh, Meg is like really, uh, you know, the definition of politeness. And, and the really, uh, when I see Meg and talk to her, I feel very impolite. I feel that, you know, I need to go back and learn how to be polite and, and learn etiquettes because she's master of politeness and etiquettes. So with that, I would like to um, uh, ask Meg to start her lecture. And she's going to lecture us today about cholangiocarcinoma current concepts. Meg? Thank you so much for that nice introduction, Cod. I find you very polite and very nice, so thank you. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about cholangiocarcinoma, and it's a bit of a broad topic, so I just wanna talk a little bit about some um, emerging concepts. So these are my disclosures. Hopefully you can see them. My most important one is last here. Um, so for the next, hopefully it'll be about 30 or 40 minutes, I wanna talk a little bit about some emerging pathologic concepts around cholangiocarcinoma and cholangiocarcinogenesis and how those pathologic features may impact the imaging appearance and how we can use the imaging appearance to um, derive some information about prognosis. Um, I want to touch briefly on clinical and imaging features of biphenotypic tumors and then I just want to end talking a little bit about challenges about uh, biopsying these types of lesions. Um, so Here's a couple papers that have come out in the last couple years that I thought were really interesting. They talk a little bit about uh, a lot of the concepts we're gonna talk about in this talk. And I can certainly get these references to people. One was in radiology, one was in AJR. There've been multiple additional that have come out in European radiology in the last couple of years as well. So um, as we all know, cholangiocarcinoma is a pretty heterogeneous disease and it encompasses a spectrum of clinical and imaging features. And this can be a really challenging um, malignancy for us as radiologists, but also for surgeons. And I think there's a lot of different ways we can think about these or classify them, which is why I struggle with them sometimes. So, you know, some people will do more of an anatomic classification of these. Are they intrahepatic or are they extrahepatic? Um, for extrahepatic lesions, they're usually perihilar and distal. Often they're perihilar infiltrating um, type anatomy. Um, for in intrahepatic lesions, they tend to be more mass forming. Um, and I think when we start to think about intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, which is what I want to spend most of this talk on, we can start to subclassify these based on the cell of origin or the location or potentially the imaging um, appearance. And we're learning that um, some of these things can also uh, imply biologic behavior as well. So um, in terms of risk factors for cholangiocarcinoma, 
um, these are not necessarily um, precursor lesions, but these are just things that can put people at risk for um, cholangiocarcinoma. And one that we know well and see a lot is primary sclerosing cholangitis, which I'm showing here. Also, cholelocal cysts, which is seen here, are at increased risk for developing cholangiocarcinoma. But also certain parasitic infections, uh, such as clonarchus, um, recurrent pyogenic cholangitis. And then we do see cholangiocarcinoma in our patients with viral hepatitis and cirrhosis. It's actually probably the second most common tumor behind hepatocellular carcinoma uh, that we see in these patients. So these are the patients that we're often imaging. These are patients where we're looking for uh, cholangiocarcinoma. And in terms of cholangiocarcinogenesis, one thing that's being discussed are the potential st uh, stem cells that these cancers arise from. So there are basically two types of stem cells that exist in the biliary tree. And one is the hepatic stem progenitor cells, the HSPCs. And their niche tends to be uh, the canal of herring, which is the most peripheral portion of the biliary drainage path. And so usually um, things that arise from these types of cells are involved in diseases affecting small or peripheral bile ducts, so kind of more out here in the periphery of the liver. Um, the other sort of stem cell in the biliary tree is the biliary tree stem progenitor cells. And these can give rise to both hepatocytes or uh, cholangiocytes. And these, their niche or niche or their origin is in the peribiliary glands, which are uh, kind of shown in green here. And these cells um, tend to be um, involved in diseases affecting larger or more central intra and hepatic, intra and extra hepatic ducts. And so intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, cholangiocarcinoma that arises in the liver can come from either of these cell types. So um, what people are talking about, these concepts support the idea that um, there are sort of two main groups of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas. There are the peripheral small duct type, which probably are arising from the hepatic stem progenitor cells. Um, and those, you know, tend to be um, less aggressive and more peripheral. Um, they often are mass forming. They're a little bit better defined. Often they have less um, central fibrosis and more arterial enhancement. And there have been several papers that have come out in European radiology in the last year or two talking about this arterial enhancement and how it's associated with a better prognosis. And because of all these things, because these are rising from the small ducts, they seem to be less aggressive. They often are uh, smaller in size at diagnosis. The large duct, um, these tend to be ill-defined. Um, they tend to have more prominent necrosis, um, more prominent central fibrotic stroma, um, and these seem to have a worse prognosis. They're more likely to develop perineural invasion, vascular involvement, lymphatic invasion, lymph node mets, and they tend to have worse surgical outcomes, five-year survivals, and, um, and overall prognosis. So this kind of goes along with that idea that there are two different types of stem cells that tumors are arising from, and depending on where they come from, it may impact their imaging appearance and it may also impact their prognosis. So here's two different cases. Um, mm -hmm. On the left, you see we've got a little bit more ill-defined lesion. Um, it's kind of low in signal intensity on the portal venous phase, it probably has some prominent necrosis, and I'm not showing you here, but probably has some central fibrous stroma. Mm -hmm. Here you can see this, this was a younger patient with primary sclerosis and cholangitis. This patient on the right, you can see that the lesion is smaller in size, it's pretty well circumscribed, has less prominent um, central necrosis, although there's probably a little, and more prominent arterial enhancement. And so this may be kind of more along the lines of that small peripheral duct type. Um, here's another example. You know, this is a patient who's got sort of an ill-defined, this is a 63-year-old man. You can see he's got a somewhat ill-defined lesion, um, kind of multiple satellite lesions. Looks like there's probably some vascular involvement. And then you've got these abnormal-looking and large portohepatous and gastrohepatic nodes. So this seems like a more aggressive lesion. It's a little bit more central in location. I would imagine this is more of sort of the uh, perihylar large duct type of, of tumor. Um, another thing that's um, 
coming to light is that there are some more, there are pre-malignant lesions. So we talked a little bit about risk factors and, and what those are. So those patients are at risk, but those aren't necessarily precursor lesions. And now, um, you know, we're defining these lesions that may undergo a multi-step carcinogenesis and become a cancer. So um, one type is biliary intraepithelial neoplasia, and this is sort of a, a microscopic finding. So this isn't something that we can identify on imaging, but we know that these lesions go through this multi-step process and then become a cancer. But one that we can, uh, or lesions that we can identify on imaging are intraductal papillary neoplasms of the bile duct, IPNBs, or mucinous cystic neoplasms, and these things kind of go together depending on whether the bile duct um, is involved or not. And the IPNBs is part of this um, sort of relatively newly proposed concept of biliary lesions in pancreatic counterparts. So this is sort of the counterpart of IPMNs in the pancreas. Um, and like IPMNs, IPNBs tend to be more common in men, um, particularly a, in their sixth, or age 60 to 66. Um, and you get this prominent pro proliferation of atypical epithelium, which um, can lead to a lesion that we can identify. And so um, what we often see, it can be a variety of appearances, but um, you start to see often this tubular dilation of the ducts if there's communication with the ducts. Um, and this is related to mucin production. There can also be papillary or fibrovascular pores that you can sometimes identify in these dilated ducts. And these tend to go, grow slowly. Sometimes people develop intermittent symptoms in biliary obstruction. And uh, like IPMNs in the pancreas, these can develop an invasive component. And because you know, this is a relatively new entity in the last 10 years or so, it's thought that about 40 to 80% may go on to develop uh, an invasive component. Um, and, and the mucin component, the mucin production is somewhat variable. Sometimes uh, up to about a third of them um, may hyperproduce uh, mucin, which can impact the imaging appearance. And so there are several things that we're looking for. You know, sometimes you see, as I said, sort of this tubular dilation of the bile ducts. Often if it's involving the bile ducts, it seems to be more commonly left-sided, although not always. Sometimes there can be some associated atrophy if it's been going on for a long time. Um, some people have described, so when you look at this, sometimes you might say, oh, this is just biliary ductal dilation, but sometimes it's hard to identify an obstructing lesion. And sometimes on MR or CT, you may see thin threads within the duct, which is what's been called the, the thread sign, this introductal linear low signal intensity um, that, that is thought to be related um, to the mucin. And often it's highly viscous. So sometimes associated with the biliary ductal dilation, you can see introductal lesions, but sometimes not. Um, sometimes you can see dilation all the way down to the main duct. Sometimes um, you can see an associated cystic lesion uh, or what may be a diverticulum uh, that's associated with it. So this was a young, youngish woman that we followed for a long time, thinking that this was just biliary ductal dilation and atrophy, and it turned out that it was actually uh, an IPNB. Um, so here again, you can see this sort of tubular or ectatic ducts. This one has an associated cystic lesion, and this seemed to communicate with the duct. This does not necessarily have the um, papillary projections, although you can see some areas of low T2 signal intensity there. Um, and, and this is another potential appearance. Here is that woman that we were talking about earlier. You can see on her MR that she's got only segmental involvement in the left lobe, and she does excrete contrast on the cladiogram, but you can almost see a meniscus of contrast around what may be mucin filling the duct. Mm -hmm. And on ultrasound, you can see that this really doesn't look like simple biliary ductal dilation. There's a lot of sort of debris and material that seems to be within the bile duct, which is probably that viscous mucin. Here's another case, but you can see that same sort of look. This one, again, would be considered sort of a mixed type MCN plus IPNB. So you can see that sort of tubular dilation, again, involving mainly the left hepatic lobe with an associated complex cystic lesion that seems to be communicating with the duct, has a similar appearance, but this one was more of a mixed type with the cystic lesion. Um, and here's another one, uh, more of same. And here you can see that this one is starting to develop some complexity. So we start to worry that something like this is developing an invasive component. Here you can see the post-contrast images in the same patient. You can see that it's starting to look complex. We are still getting a little bit of hepatobiliary excretion, but 
not a lot of filling of this dilated mucin filled duct. And here's another patient. This one has those sort of internal papillary projections that you can see here, and they're almost sort of collapsing down out through the ampulla, which we can sometimes see with the pancreatic counterpart as well. Um, and on post contrast, here you can see it on T2, there's all these papillary projections filling this tubular dilated duct. Um, and this was a, an IPNB that had developed an invasive component. Um, so thinking back to cholangiocarcinoma, as I mentioned earlier, as radiologists, we commonly classify these by the way they look. Either their macroscopic growth pattern, their sort of periductal infiltrating where we just see bile duct wall thickening, or mass forming, which is usually a mass out in the hepatic parenchyma, or intraductal growing, which is the least common type and tends to have the best prognosis. But the other way that we can think about these is their anatomic location. So either extrahepatic, which tend to be periductal infiltrating because they're involving the duct, or intrahepatic, which tends to be more mass forming. And as I mentioned, a lot of what we're talking about now is this mass forming or intrahepatic type. But we'll touch briefly on some of these other types as well, because I think they can be challenging. So the periductal infiltri infiltrating type, you know, these often just manifest as, as bile duct wall thickening. Um, often it's, you know, three millimeters or so and may enhance more briskly than the rest of the bile duct wall. When they're very early stage, they can be very challenging. Um, as they grow, they tend to show longer segment involvement and they can have some asymmetric um, growth or there can be some nodular or irregular luminal narrowing. Sometimes you start to see periductal soft tissue or an associated mass, and you can see some associated lymph node enlargement. And what's most important with these is we want to look at the extent of involvement. Is it involving um, the intra, the main left and right intrahepatic ducts, or is it involving secondary biliary radicals? Is there vascular involvement, and is there metastatic disease? With the intraductal growing type, you know these are the least common type. They tend to be small, sessile, and polypoid. I think these sometimes can mimic stones. So you can see it here on the CT and as a filling defect with a small meniscus around it on the ERCP. These can cause segmental ductal dilation. These can be multiple and like IPMB, sometimes these can make mucin, um, but these tend to have the best overall prognosis. And then uh, the mass forming type um, is the type that we often see, you know, within the hepatic parenchyma. These are usually large and lobulated. Sometimes they have irregular or nodular margins. Um, they often will show early peripheral enhancement, but if they have a lot of fibrous stroma, then sometimes you can see more prominent central enhancement on delayed imaging, and that's usually about 10 or 11 minutes post. We're always looking for satellite lesions because these are often multicentric, so you can see that there are some small satellites here, and this can impact um, resectability. And then we're also looking for things like capsule retraction because this is such a fibrous tumor, sometimes it'll start to pull the capsule in um, and sometimes we'll actually see some peripheral biliary ductal dilation, which you can see here. Um, and as we just talked about, you know, the typical CT features of a mass forming lesion, again, on a portal venous or earlier phase, you may see some peripheral enhancement. Often there's an irregular pushing margin. You can see that there's some delayed enhancement on a 10 minute delay and that's that central fibrous stroma which is enhancing. Um, sometimes there's vascular involvement and it seems that often it's more a squeezing of the vessels from the sort of fibrous stroma rather than uh, an invasion of the vessels, although you can occasionally see that. So often you'll see this transient hepatic attenuation difference that we see here. You can see this peripheral arterial enhancement around the lesion because it's squeezing the left portal vein and more of the left lobe supply is arising from the left hepatic artery. And then here you can see that more central delayed enhancement. Sometimes you're seeing the capsular retraction and then occasionally we do see some peripheral biliary ductal dilation, which, which we're not seeing as well here. Here's another case. This was a 51-year-old male. You can see that this is a pretty large lesion. It has what looked like some prominent necrosis, some associated capsular retraction and peripheral biliary ductal dilation. And you can see that there's some abnormal lymph nodes in the porta. So I might imagine this is more uh, arising from the biliary progenitor cells. This is more of a large or central duct type that's going to have a worse prognosis. You can also see that there's some infiltration of the fat out here. So you start to worry that this is breaking out of the capsule and involving the peritoneum. Here's another example. This is a 72-year-old woman. You can see that early peripheral arterial enhancement. 
prominent necrosis on delayed imaging. There's probably some central fibrous stroma. You can see that she's got multiple satellite lesions, some perihepatic ascites. Again, this one looks like it has a little bit more uh, aggressive features. And then here on MR, you can see um, a, this is a different patient. You can see again that it's a pretty large lesion. It's got some intermediate to high T2 signal intensity, that prominent capsular attraction, just like we see on CT, some peripheral enhancement, um, multiple satellite lesions. Um, so a lot of the same um, imaging features that we would see on CT. Um, often we do uh, dynamic enhancement and a dynamic post contrast enhancement. And again, you can see that uh, delayed enhancement if there's prominent fibrous stroma. Um, And now we're finding that when patient, when people are using hepatobiliary agents, there are some other features uh, that we're seeing. So um, this is, uh, I'll, sh I'll show it to you here. Um, this is the hepatobiliary. As you get more delayed, you see this delayed enhancement. And sometimes um, in the hepatobiliary phase, you actually see some concentration of the contrast agent. You can see that we don't always do pet for these, but they can be very hot on pet. So this was a, a 63 year old male with a, with a pretty aggressive lesion. And here's another one. This is a 44 year old woman with primary sclerosis and cholangitis. You can see that this looks like there's some, a perihylar component, a perihylar infiltrating lesion with an associated mass. You can see that it's fairly ill-defined, doesn't really show much arterial enhancement. It has prominent fibrous stroma on the delayed imaging. So again, this looks more like that large duct type, uh, potentially a more aggressive type of lesion. And then um, here you can see, oops, there are, um, this is a hepatobiliary phase uh, of imaging with EOVIST, and most mass forming intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas don't take up the hepatobiliary agent because they don't have the appropriate transporter, they don't have biliary cells necessarily within them but occasionally they'll show this intermediate or mixed hyperintensity during that patobiliary phase. And it might be because the contrast agent is pooling in the fibrous stroma, um, which creates a larger sort of extracellular space. And um, if you see this, this target appearance on the hepatobiliary phase, so you can see kind of this faint accumulation of contrast here, that's more frequently associated with um, tumors with abundant central stromal fibrosis. So when you see this sort of cloud-like central hyperintensity, it suggests that there's more central fibrosis, which tends to be, at least in my mind, associated more with these large duct or more central duct type lesions that tend to be a little bit more aggressive. Mm -hmm. And that seems to correspond with something that's been dubbed a target sign on diffusion weighted imaging. And so here, what I imagine is happening is that you've got a more prominent cellular component out here at the periphery, which tends to uh, restrict diffusion. So you can see it's bright on our, our the 800-ish and dark on our ADC map. And then you've got this prominent central stroma, which doesn't restrict as much. Um, and so I think that kind of goes along with what, we're, what we see on the hepatobiliary phase in this patient. Um, this target sign has also been described as useful for distinguishing intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma from hepatocellular carcinoma. So when we're looking at cirrhotic patients, and sometimes it's not totally clear, is this a typical HCC or is this more of a cholangiocarcinoma, this target sign is seen more frequently on DWI in mass forming intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma than hepatocellular carcinoma, but not all ICC not all intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas show this targetoid appearance, um, so it's not always simple. Um, this was a 37-year-old woman, um, and both her dominant lesion and her satellite lesions show this sort of targetoid appearance. And she underwent resection. You can see that ultimately, unfortunately, she recurred. And again, even her recurrence on a pedobiliary phase kind of shows that cloud-like retention of EOVIS, sort of that targetoid appearance on diffusion-weighted imaging. So here's a different patient. This is a 54-year-old male with cirrhosis. 
And I'm showing you the arterial phase. Um, this is a two minute delay, and then this is a diffusion weighted imaging. And so you can see that he's got this heterogeneously enhancing lesion, but at two minutes, it's really not definitively washing out. You're kind of wondering if it's enhancing equally as much or maybe a little bit more. And then you can see that it has that sort of targetoid appearance on the diffusion weighted image. So this makes us concerned that maybe this isn't an HCC and is actually an intrahepatic cholangio. And since it's an atypical lesion, uh, we went on to biopsy it, and this did turn out to be a cholangiocarcinoma. Here's another case, um, same sort of idea. This was a patient with cirrhosis. You can see the ascites, and you can see that he's got this peripherally enhancing lesion, does show a little bit of fill-in and more even at two minutes, so really not a typical HCC. And when we look at his diffusion-weighted imaging, you can see that targetoid appearance again, um, which turned out to be a cholangiocarcinoma in a cirrhotic patient. And here's another one. This is another cirrhotic patient. You can see this lesion with prominent peripheral arterial enhancement seems to fill in more on the delay, and you see that targetoid appearance on diffusion-weighted imaging. We would you know, biopsy this regardless because it's not a typical HCC, but um, that helps us feel a little bit more confident when we see that, that this is probably a cholangiocarcinoma, which will really change how we treat this patient and what treatments potentially they're eligible for. So in terms of imaging and prognosis, um, we've talked a little bit about, you know, the cell that it's arising from, how that impacts how it looks, and what that might mean for prognosis. Um, but it seems that um, those introductal growing lesions, so the sort of papillary ones, which are very uncommon, seem to have a relatively good prognosis. If you have a, a mass lesion with prominent arterial enhancement, I've shown you a couple examples, that more homogeneous enhancement with, um, with less central necrosis or fibrosis, those seem to do better. And if they have a larger area of restricted diffusion, which just goes along with the idea that they're more cellular and maybe have less uh, stromal fibrosis, these seem to have a little bit better biologic or a little bit less aggressive biologic behavior and a little bit better prognosis. If they show a lot of that delayed enhancement or that cloud-like retention on the hepatobiliary phase, those seem to have more um, central fibrosis. They seem to be more uh, the large duct type potentially and seem to have a worse prognosis. And certainly we're seeing some newer agents for treatment of these lesions. So um, the uh, fibroblast, the FGFR um, blockers, which may do better in more fibrous lesions, but as of now, these, these tend to have a worse prognosis, it seems. I want to just spend a few minutes touching briefly on um, biphenotypic tumors. I think we've had sort of a growing awareness of these types of tumors, which are an admixture of both hepatocellular carcinoma and cholangiocarcinoma. Um, and they may have uh, a little bit more HCC sometimes, a little bit more ICC. And there was a paper that came out in uh, hepatology in the last year or two that sort of uh, adjusted the classification of these to maybe make it a little bit uh, more straightforward to make this diagnosis. Um, but these uh, tend to be seen in patients with chronic liver disease. They tend to arise from those peripheral hepatic stem progenitor cells that are sort of the smaller duct. So it may be that they behave more like a peripheral small duct um, ICC. I think in general, we think about these as falling somewhere between a hepatocellular carcinoma and a cholangiocarcinoma, maybe not quite as bad as a typical cholangiocarcinoma, but maybe a little bit worse than an HCC. And that, that's not always the case. And, and I think our, you know, the way uh, we think about these is evolving, but that went from a treatment standpoint, I think that's kind of how we think about them. And in the literature, you know, there's sort of a range of, you know, incidents or prevalence of this type of lesion because I think we're becoming more aware of it. Um, we're trying to uh, do a better job of diagnosing it. And I think uh, now with the revamped sort of pathologic definitions, you know, we'll start to maybe do a better job getting a handle on how many are out there, but it's anywhere from less than 1% to about 14% of primary hepatic malignancies. Um, and, you know, I think if we can make this diagnosis prior to any sort of operative treatment, it can be really helpful because it certainly may impact what we do with them. It may impact their eligibility for transplant. Often, you know, we have to biopsy them to know for sure. Um, and when we biopsy them, if it looks heterogeneous, sampling a couple different areas, 
um, might be helpful. And the amount of each tumor type, the amount of cholangio versus HCC may impact what it looks like on imaging. I think looking at the tumor markers can be helpful as well, particularly the CA199 and the alpha feta protein. So if it looks like a cholangio, but there's a really high AFP or some sort of discordance between the imaging features and the tumor markers, that might help us suspect it as well. Um, in terms of the imaging appearance, I think that these are challenging to accurately diagnose preoperatively. There have been a couple of nice studies looking, doing reader studies trying to make this diagnosis. And the sensitivity was in the 33 to 35% range with specificity a little bit better. Um, almost all of these lesions show this arterial peripheral enhancement like we see here. Um, the other imaging features um, can be variable. Often there's an absence of sort of the classic features of hepatocellular carcinoma, that homogeneous central enhancement and washout. Um, I think looking at, as I said earlier, the clinical factors and their risk factors, you know, is it someone with uh, cirrhosis from viral hepatitis? Is it someone more with PSC? What do their tumor markers look like? And is it discordant with what the imaging appearance looks like? Then we might suggest this type of tumor. But certainly, you know, if we see that arterial peripheral enhancement, they have elevated CA99 and AFP, um, I think it's useful to do a biopsy in these cases and try to sample multiple areas if you can. Um, another, uh, in this study that came out in 2016, they talked about the presence of ancillary features. So um, most of the time, if you use the ancillary features from the LIRADS classification, you'll almost always categorize these as non-HCC malignancy or potentially a, a LIRADS M type of category. Um, but the ancillary features that we're looking for are things that may suggest cholangic carcinoma. So capsular retraction, that biliary ductal dilation, potentially restricted diffusion, that rim enhancement, um, and then some of the other findings that we talked about on, on MR. If you see features of both, so say you see some capsular retraction, some peripheral biliary ductal dilation, but you also see vascular invasion, which can happen with a cholangio carcinoma, but it's a little bit less typical. It seems like it's exhibiting behaviors, both of HCC, which tends to be more angiocentric, and cholangio carcinoma, then you might raise the possibility of a biphenotypic tumor. And either way, if it doesn't have typical features of an HCC, a lot of the time we're gonna move towards biopsying these. Um, or if it has some features of cholangiocarcinoma, but not all, like there's no biliary ductal dilation, there's no target sign on the DWI, then maybe you would think about an HCC, especially if the tumor markers might suggest both, which, which isn't always the case, but can sometimes be helpful. Here's an example. This was a man um, with alcoholic liver disease, and you can see that he's got this lesion. It's got some nodular enhancement kind of on one side that looks like it's washing out. But another area that sort of shows very little arterial enhancement, uh, maybe a little bit of delayed enhancement and no surrounding biliary ductal dilation. So it was a very atypical lesion in cirrhotic liver and he came for biopsy. Um, this was sort of a challenging biopsy because where it's located, so we put in a little bit of fluid to pull it down. And when you look at it, you can see that there's sort of a hyperechoic component here, but also a hypoechoic component. So it looks almost two-tone. And so we tried to sample both areas and it turned out to be a biphenotypic tumor. Um, here's another case. Um, this was uh, a younger guy in his 50s, but you can see that he does have underlying liver disease. He had hepatitis C. And on the arterial phase, you can see that strong peripheral whim enhancement, but it's not that more homogeneous enhancement with washout. And as we go more delayed, it actually looks like there's some central enhancement, but there's no capsular retraction, there's no biliary ductal dilation, and it's a fairly small peripheral lesion. So not not totally typical for HCC, um, could be a cholangiocarcinoma, but doesn't have all the features. And so this one we went on to biopsy, and this was also a biphenotypic tumor. And as I'll talk about, um, it actually took us three biopsies to get this diagnosis. And so sometimes these um, can be challenging to diagnose for a variety of reasons. Um, and that um, brings me to sort of my last thing that I wanted to talk about, and that's biopsy of cholangiocarcinoma. And uh, this applies, I suppose, to biphenotypic tumors as well. Um, because these are pretty fibrous lesions, um, it can be a very challenging diagnosis to make. As I say to trainees often, I feel like a lot of tumors will give up cells. If you get your needle in the tumor, a lot of times they will give up cells. But 
cholangiac carcinoma, perhaps because it's often such a fibrous lesion, is one of those tumors that just does not give up cells even when you're in the lesion sometimes. And this is well documented in the literature for the periductal infiltrating types of lesions that we were talking about earlier. So if you just do endoscopic brushings, it's about 43% sensitive. You can do a little bit better if you do an endoscopic biopsy. You can also do a percutaneous transluminal biopsy and a little bit better. But because we know that these tumors, these periductal tumors often don't give up cells, we follow these with imaging even if the biopsy comes back negative. And um, we recently looked at this in intrahepatic cholangiac carcinomas as well, because I think this is well documented in these periductal infiltrating lesions, but maybe not as well documented in these large mass forming lesions, because certainly we look at these on imaging and we say, this is a very large target, it's easy to get in it, we should be able to make a diagnosis here. But we have found that even with you know, large mass forming lesions, we see the same phenomenon, maybe not quite to the extent that we see it with periductal infiltrating lesions, but very similar. And this is a study where we looked just at our intrahepatic cholangiac carcinomas versus controls, which were largely other types of metastatic disease in the liver. But you can see that in general, as you've seen from the examples and as you've probably seen in your practice, these lesions tend to be very large. Our, me our mean size was uh, 6.1 centimeters, median was 5.3. Our controls were actually a lot smaller, about half the size. Um, and we tend to do liver biopsies with ultrasound guidance, if at all possible. So almost, almost all of them were done with ultrasound. We almost always do 18 gauge cores. And we usually taste at least a couple passes. Um, our median number of passes in both the controls and our intrahepatic cholangios was two. And in terms of a discordant result, we saw that uh, there was a res so, for example, if we get a result, we biopsy a lesion and it comes back just cirrhotic liver, we'd say, well, that's probably not concordant with a lesion that looks like a mass. So that's probably, so ultimately you get a diagnosis, but you say that really doesn't match what I think I should get based on the imaging appearance. And we saw that about 16% of the time in our intrahepatic cholangiac carcinomas and only about 3% of the time in our controls. So it was much more common that we'd have to repeat a biopsy in our intrahepatic cholangiac carcinomas uh, than our controls. The other problem is that when you get this discordant result, if you don't close the loop with a referring provider, they may think that it just is a, mal a malignancy. And so sometimes our patients would be lost to follow up for a short time or they wouldn't get a prompt repeat biopsy if we didn't close the loop on that result. So you can see that there was a delay from detection to diagnosis of about 59 days in our intrahepatic cholangiac carcinomas compared to our controls. So, you know, I, I think this is just a, an important phenomenon to be aware of. I think we as radiologists in our practice may know this, but sometimes our referring providers don't. And we've had multiple cases where a result came back as just cirrhotic liver or fibrosis, and it was thought to be not a tumor, and the, the biopsy wasn't repeated. And so I think it, it's important for us to be aware, make sure we look at our result, look at our imaging and say, is this concordant or do we need to biopsy this again? And for something that you think might be intrahepatic cholangiac carcinoma, if you don't get that result on your biopsy, I think if it's safe, um, having a low threshold to re-biopsy is, is reasonable. Mm -hmm. So here's the case I just showed you. This is that man that has what looks like a, an atypical lesion, certainly doesn't look like a typical HCC, mm -hmm. could be a cholangio, but doesn't have all the features. Here we see it on ultrasound. We actually biopsied it uh, three times before we got the result. And this took us greater than six months um, to make this diagnosis in this patient and ultimately you know, he was not a surgical candidate because he had uh, cirrhosis. He was really not considered a transplant candidate because of the cholangiac carcinoma component. So we've tended to treat these a little more aggressively with local regional therapy. And he had, we did a combo therapy because this one was small. So we did transarterial chemoembolization followed by ablation. He did pretty well for over a year, but then ultimately recurred. Sometimes we go, if it's a larger lesion, we may go right to a radioembolization if they're not a surgical or transplant candidate. Here's another case. This was a 53-year-old male with underlying liver disease. You can see this sort of ill-defined lesion up at the dome. We had to biopsy this one four times um, to get the diagnosis. We did it twice. It was done twice outside with CT, twice with ultrasound at our place. And you can see that the needle is clearly in the lesion. And so um, this is one of those tumors that really sometimes doesn't give up cells. And what we sometimes do is, you know, we may add ultrasound contrast that may help us better target a, a place that we think is viable. Sometimes we change needles, so we tend to use um, an end hole cutting device. Uh, for most of our biopsies, it's an adjustable throw, but with these really fibrous lesions, sometimes it doesn't do as well, so we may change over to a side hole cutting device if we haven't gotten a biopsy result that we think is concordant. Um, so those are some things that we've tried uh, in these patients to help improve the yield. 
The other thing is that in our series, we looked at biopsy of the dominant lesion versus a satellite lesion. And certainly the majority of our lesions were satellites. Um, I thought personally that maybe you know, targeting a satellite might give us better results. It wasn't all that different, to be honest. Here's another lesion. This was a very atypical lesion. This was a 66-year-old woman. Um, this lesion was way up at the dome. Um, you can see that maybe there's a little bit of capsular retraction, but no biliary ductal dilation. She did not have known liver disease. And on MR, it was very confusing. It showed some homogeneous enhancement, maybe some areas that were kind of washing out, maybe some areas that showed more delayed enhancement. And then on the in and out of phase, it almost looked like there was intracellular lipid in this lesion, which was very confusing. So she underwent serial imaging. Ultimately, a biopsy was recommended. But this is, you know, she was a this was a very challenging biopsy, pretty hard to see. The biopsy came back negative. Um, so then greater than six months later, she was imaged again. You can see that the lesion has grown, and on intraoperative ultrasound, it looks even more ominous. Um, and this turned out to be a cholangiocarcinoma at surgical resection with two nodes positive, and ultimately she went on to diagnose or to develop metastatic disease. So certainly we just want to be vigilant for things that we think might be cholangiocarcinoma and, and close the loop if we think a biopsy needs to be repeated. Here's another one. This was a 71-year-old woman, um, underlying liver disease. You can see she's got a heterogeneous caudate lesion, probably shows some enhancement and some washout, but um, this is hepatobiliary phase, so not really true portal venous washout. So we thought it was a little bit atypical. So we biopsied it. This is a tough lesion. We ended up taking a, a transhepatic approach through the left lobe to get to the caudate. It looks like we really are in it here, um, but the result came back you know, non-neoplastic liver with steatohepatitis. We took a couple passes. So then she had follow-up imaging. Um, you can see that, you know, this is six months later and then a year later, and this has grown pretty dramatically. Um, repeat biopsy, had to go through again, um, did a couple passes. She, you know, we were a little bit more aggressive. She did develop a small hematoma, um, and this turned out to be cholangiocarcinoma, but it took us greater than a year to make this diagnosis. So I think that, you know, cholangiocarcinoma and biphenotypic tumors, you know, can be challenging. We just need to have a low threshold to repeat biopsy if we think our result is not concordant. So in conclusion, um, cholangiocarcinoma is a heterogeneous disease. We can classify it in a variety of ways, either as anatomic location or it's more, you know, morphologic growth pattern, periductal infiltrating versus mass forming. But for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, the, this idea is emerging that there's really two distinct pathologic subtypes and that they have different imaging features and that those imaging features may correlate with their biologic behavior and their clinical outcomes. So potentially it could impact how we treat them. Um, we wanna be aware of these precursor lesions that we can identify on imaging like IPNB. Um, we need to be aware that they have fairly high malignant potential and, and watch them closely um, if they're not resected. Um, biophenotypic tumors, really challenging imaging diagnosis. They can show imaging features of both intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma carcinoma and hepatocellular carcinoma. They may have discordant imaging features with their tumor markers, and often these require biopsy to really make a confident diagnosis. And along the lines of biopsy, biopsying these lesions, especially if they're really fibrous lesions, can be challenging. They require repeat sampling. You may have to try to sample multiple areas in the same lesion. You may have to add some adjuncts like contrast or change your needle um, and just have a a low threshold to repeat a biopsy if discordant results are seen. And just as a reminder, I think that we are uniquely suited to decide whether our biopsy is concordant or not. And it's really important for us to follow up our biopsies and close the loop, especially with tumors like this. These are those references that I talked about at the beginning. Um, there are multiple more that have come out. Um, and I have the reference um, from Hepatology in 2018 that talks about pathologic classification of biphenotypic tumors if anyone is interested. Thanks very much for your attention.